Our scripture morning is taking the second book of Corinthians, chapter 8, and verse 9, which reads, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Lord, may we seek these riches and not those of the world, so that we may be like our Savior as we wait his return. The title of today's message is Grace to Live. The type of grace we want to talk about is sustaining grace, the grace that keeps you going when times get tough, when the lights go out. This is the grace that sustains us through life's valleys, when we go down in the dips and uh, no longer can see the, the hilltops. But in order to receive this grace, in order to hold on to Jesus Christ, the dispenser of grace, you have to know him. If you don't know him, how can you hold on to him? So, Lord, we ask that you'll help us to know our Lord and hold on to him so we receive and appreciate this grace and be thankful for it. Amen. So, you need a new batch of grace when you get into some bad situations. For example, like your child doesn't live. Uh, clo or a close member of your family dies. It could be your father or someone. Then their anniversary or their birthday comes up a year later and you're reminded all over again. Ah, the pain hits you. Or it could be a physical infir infirmity that you've been struck with. You're not a temporary thing. Something that really hits you and stays with you a long time, like losing a limb in an accident or from, from an IED. And when, Especially when you realize that whatever you've lost is not coming back, then you you feel bad. You, you know you know it's you're not going to be cured by a, a pill or a quick surgery or something. It's not like a you know tonsil or gallbladder uh, removal. It's something more of a permanent nature that really wears on you. It bears on you. Or when you realize that what you've been dreaming of, what you were looking for in the future, it's never going to happen. For example, an athlete, you know, cut down his prime because of an accident, no longer has the physical capacity to do what they wanted to do. Now life has to take a different direction. And when that happens, you need a, some grace. You need a special unction of grace. But it's not the kind of grace that promises everything's going to work out the way you hope, because you know that's not true. That's, that's fiction. It's a story. You need something different. Uh, not one that offers guarantees, except one. Salvation, the end. And the grace like that is seldom under, understood because we like solutions. And it's hard to, hard to explain it or articulate. You may feel it, but how do you explain it? But there's nothing you need to produce on your own. It's not what you do that gives, causes God to, to bestow grace upon us. This kind of grace we're talking about is what God gives you when you have nothing left. When you really get down to the bottom, when you're discouraged, when you don't see any hope. This is a special kind of grace that you need. It's the hope of the moment. The hope of Christ. When you come to believe that Jesus is enough. There was a, a weather men are frequently uh, unwelcome when they bring bad news. They tell us, you know, there's a tornado coming quickly. There's a hurricane coming up the coast. A uh, snowstorm is coming. Uh, the weather's going to be very hot. You're going to wear out your air conditioner. There's all sorts of news that the weatherman brings, and much of the time it's not good. They're not welcome. The Bible tells us about a weatherman who was particularly unwelcome. This is the prophet Elijah. God had given him the insight, the advanced knowledge that there is going to be no rain, there's going to be a drought, it's going to get dry. Uh, being a prophet of God, he communicated the news as he was instructed, and that was to the king and queen of the country, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Now these uh, individuals we know were, were wicked people, they did not follow God at all, and God had brought this drought to send a message to them, to them and the, the, those who were caught up in the wickedness. But unfortunately, you know, a drought affects everybody, the good, the bad, and the, and the ugly. So everything dried up. And, uh, Elijah had to do something. You know, like you see people here, they're digging deep in the ground, trying to find a little bit of water because there's nothing around. It's parched. So, so God, Elijah needed to survive too. He needed water and food like anybody else. So God gave him instructions. He said, get out of town. 
He told him where to go. Go east. There was a ravine uh, called Kareth on the other side of the Jordan River. There there was fresh water, was told. And very interestingly, God had told ravens to feed him. Now, you know, ravens are rapacious. They're hungry. They like to eat. They would not by any normal stretch of the matter uh, be carrying food to anybody unless perhaps was the young ones in a nest, like, like most birds. You know, what they get, they gobble out. But God had performed uh, a miracle here and had ravens supply him with food on a regular basis. You know, it's dinner time. Okay, the food's coming out the sky. You know, thank you, Lord. Thank you, ravens. Incredible miracle. So Elijah obeyed. He uh, had water to drink. He had food on a regular basis. Water, of course, is, is a natural uh, type of grace, a blessing, an unearned blessing that God gives us. In this case, it came from a brook. The ravens delivering food, well, that's truly supernatural, way out of the ordinary. But, but God is able. There was a need, and God fulfilled that. Eventually, the drought got so severe, the brook dried up. There wasn't any water left. So God gave his, his prophet Elijah more instructions. Get up and go to Zarephath and Sidon and live there. Instruct a widow who lives there, a a woman who lives there, a widow to feed you. And this is very strange. Widows were the most poverty-stricken, hardest-up people in society back then. They they didn't have anything. Uh, Things uh, that is possessions and inheritances went through the male side of the family, not the female side. The women usually didn't get much of anything, and not having a place outside the home, not working like they frequently do nowadays. They had no income. They were poverty stricken. And this woman, uh, uh, to boot, had a child to take care of. So she was really hard up and God gave this strange instruction to Elijah. But he went up. He went to Zarephath. He found the woman at the entrance of the village. She was gathering firewood and asked her, hey, can you bring me a little bit of water? And of course, the brook had dried up. He was thirsty. And uh, as she's going, said, hey, can you bring me, bring me something to eat? And the woman turns around and says, hey, look, I don't even have a biscuit. I got a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. I'm getting ready to make our mass, last meal. And then we're going we're gonna to croak. We're going to die. We have nothing more. But under these circumstances, Elijah said, nah, don't worry about it. Give, make for me first. Then for you and your son. Again, strange. Why first? What it really was, we find out, was an expression of faith that she could believe in a prophet and the promise what she followed and told her about. The flower's not going to run out. The oil's not going to run out until God sends rain again, ends the drought. And no, God's going to take care of you. She believed him. She brought him uh, something to eat first, then her family, and as a result of her faith and obedience, she was blessed. She had food. She and her son did not die. And when we can have faith in God, friends, God is able to bless us. But he wants to see that faith before he sends his special blessings. He pours out the grace. However, despite God's fulfilling his promises, things happen in this world. People get sick. You know, children often do. Most of the time they get better because they're they're strong. Uh, But in this case, it got worse. The son just stopped breathing. And then the woman started remonstrating. She started changed from appreciating the blessings of God to complaining about the prophet like he dumped on her or something. You know, you're a holy man, you've exposed my sins. And the Bible doesn't tell us anything about this, but apparently she felt affected spiritually by the presence of a prophet residing in her home. And then accusing him of killing her son. Now, we know death comes from the devil. It does not come from God. But God gets blamed for many things the devil does. And Light says, kill me, your son. He took him up to his room, started praying on him. And he said, oh God, my God, why have you brought this terrible thing on this woman, this widow who has opened her home to me? Why have you killed her son? Then he stretched out himself over top of the body. Did this three times, praying, God, my God, put breath back into this boy's body. God answered his prayer. Put breath back in the body. He returned the, the son to the mother. And then she gave God glory. Said, said, I see it all now. You are a holy man. When you speak, God speaks a true word. We see many times, uh, at least 
it's it's common in our in our culture, some others, where there are people who put on performances and they have people throwing away their canes and walkers and whatnot, and making a real display out of healing. But friends, when God performs miracles of healing, it's for His glory, not so someone can show off or put on a performance. It is He wants to be glorified, and He wants us to be doing that. We we'll find another situation where God performed a miracle with food, a very familiar one. This is after Jesus had been uh, preaching, and he was trying to get away from the people a little bit. He had a, a difficult life to be spending hours out in the outdoors, you know, preaching to people without any microphone system. Uh, could be very laborious. It could be tiring. And after a while, a person wants a break. But people are attracted to uh, Jesus because of all the miracles he'd done, all the, pe- uh, the sick that he healed. Well, that's a good thing. It's not bad. But after a while, he wants a break. So he went to the other side of this uh, little piece of water, uh, climbed a hill and sat down, uh, surrounded by disciples. And was uh, the time of year was close to Passover, which is an annual feast of Jews. And he saw a large crowd. You know, they'd followed him around. They'd gone around the, the other side of the lake. And the people by this time were hungry. And he asked Philip, uh, where can we buy bread to feed these people? Now, this was what you call a rhetorical question, a question to start a discussion, not a, discu- a question which was really expecting an answer. Because Jesus already had a plan. He knew what he was going to do. And Philip said, 200 silver pieces won't be enough to buy just a little bit of bread for each person. I mean, this... And where would you get the bread? They didn't have big commercial bakeries back then like we do. You know, where would you get the food? Where would you get the money? And even if you did, it wouldn't be enough because there were thousands of people. But another one of the disciples was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He said, hey, this little boy's got a lunch. And his lunch had five barley loaves and two fish. And these barley loaves obviously are pretty small if this is going to be a lunch for one little boy. The fish are obviously pretty small too. Otherwise, you'd be talking about a lunch for a family, not for a little boy. And they realize, hey, for a crowd like this, this is just a drop in a bucket. It wouldn't do anything. But Jesus knew the Father. He knew what he could do. Uh, like the prophet Elijah. He said, hey, make the people sit down. And there was nice green grass. There was a comfortable place. And they sat down, maybe 5,000. And realized back then when they counted, they only counted the men. They didn't include all the women and children. So we're probably talking... You know, maybe 15,000 people or more. She took the bread, he gave thanks, and he started handing it out. And he did the same with the fish. He blessed them, hand them out. And everybody ate all they wanted from this little boy's lunch. And when they're done, everybody was full, didn't want any more. They collected the leftovers, 12 full baskets. That's when the people realized what a big miracle had been performed. And they said, this is the prophet for sure. It's God's prophet right here in Galilee. But one of the people's problems was that they were looking for uh, the type of Messiah they're looking for. Or they wanted to, were, were minded to grab Jesus and, and make him king. So Jesus had to get away from them. That wasn't his time. It wasn't what he's supposed to do, do there and then. But we see, again, God poured out great blessings upon the people and fed them. We come into situations in life sometimes where we need to give our all. Like that little boy, you know, he had to give up his lunch. That was the only thing he had. It was the only thing around. But in order for people to be blessed, he had to give that up. How about the woman? She gave up her last meal. She had to uh, sacrifice that. Maybe that's happening in your life sometimes. You need to give up something. You need to give all. Not just what's convenient, not just what's in your hand or what you feel like giving, but your all in order for God's blessings to fall upon you, for his bountiful grace to be poured out. Uh, another common one is when uh, we have tithes to pay and our bills are still due. Now, which do you pay first? It's a, it's a faith test, friends. It's a very difficult one, but it's something that commonly happens. Uh, Christ said, for whoever, in the uh, book of Matthew, read, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, this is going even more extreme end. You're not just giving up money. You're giving up your life. Are we willing to do that for Jesus, friends? That is quite a stretch. 
But he said so. The master said so. He's looking for that. And it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to give up our physical life. It may mean we're going to change a career and do something different that we, than we, what we planned or wanted to do, something in conformance with God's will, his plans for our life. So look about the widow. She had the grain had gone, the brook was dried up, crops are dried up, oil flour used up, nothing left. I had a hope ready to die. But who do we have left, friends? The psalmist says, Whom I have I in heaven but you? There's none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. No matter how far down we get and what nothing we have left, there's still Jesus, friends. He holds it all together. And Colossians tells him, He created everything. All, uh, all things are created through him, for him, and he is before all things. In him all things consist. Jesus is like the invisible glue that holds the universe together. Like gravity. You don't see it. You don't know it's there. In the same way Jesus is there, he's holding the universe together. He made it. In our lives, we uh, oftentimes see problems. We come up in dilemmas and situations. So we make we look at the situation and figure, well, this is what I need to do. It's what I'll do. Come up with some sort of solution. Then we tell God about it. Then we wait for his intervention, you know, what for him to do what uh, we think he should do. What God often does then is something different, even the opposite, because he was not at the beginning of our plans. We made our plans without him, without consulting him. Then consequences happen. You know, God's going to work out his way. He doesn't take directions from us. We can make requests of him, but he's going to do that in conformance with his will, not ours. But we teach him, treat him as sometimes like a, a divine vending machine. It doesn't work that way. I'll give an example. Back in uh, when, the, uh, when the Hebrews came out of uh, Egypt, when they finally got freedom, uh, God was lit, uh, Pharaoh let go of them. They are going out on their way through the desert. Uh, the shortest way to go to the promised land was through the Philistine country. Now, the Philistines, you know, were terrible enemies of the Israelites for many centuries. But God recognized these people aren't ready for war. They're not ready to fight these guys. Uh, if, they did, if they did, they might change their minds and go, or go back to Egypt. Remember when they didn't get... Uh, food like they wanted. They were ready, ready to curse, or they weren't ready to, they were cursing uh, Moses and putting him down saying, yeah, let's go back to Egypt. And they were imagining, you know, it was a good place when it was an awful place of slavery. Their minds were so perverted by Satan. God knew this. He recognized the weakness and so led him a different way around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. It wasn't what God really wanted to have happen, but it's what was best for the people at the time. He led them where they needed to go, not where the way they wanted to go. He does the same thing to us many times. So we say to ourselves, yeah, I'm going to need off and running. Thank you, God. See you later. I know where I'm going. I know it's all going to work out, so let's go. I'll check in if I run some big obstacles and need your help. Thank you very much. And we're off and running, doing our own thing, our own way. And who do we leave behind again? God wasn't part of our planning. We weren't depending on him. Oh, unless we get in trouble. Then we look into uh, the divine problem solver. Then we get on our knees and start praying. But not before. We need to get out of the kiddie pool of faith and get into some deep water. Water where we can't touch the bottom. Then when we were truly dependent on God and not dependent on our, fully dependent on ourselves, then we can start having faith. We need to be really willing to dive in deep where we can't even see the bottom we need to develop a faith like that and dependence on god but while you're waiting on god there's the four things we can do trust in the lord he's going to do good like abram which is what abraham was called before god changed his name when he was told to get out of here he didn't know exactly where he was going didn't was like what did he do he started walking eventually got there what was, it, was he to do to dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness? In other words, be faithful. Walk on faith, not sight. And then delight yourself in the Lord. We uh, look for something other than what we have. We don't look, truly delight ourselves in the situation that God's placed us in, the blessings he's given us. We look for something else and different. But if we... Will truly delight in him, then he'll give us the desires of our heart. That's his promise. 
Finally, we need to commit our way to his, to him. Walk in his way, trust in him. and He will act. We can trust God. But if we're not committed to his way, or if we're listening to the devil and getting sidetracked, we can't expect his blessings, can we? But we can't expect him to allow bad things to happen to us to help us open our eyes and get back on the route that he wants us to. Let's look at a little scripture here in Ephesians for a quick moment. Uh, very, right at the very beginning, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Note, first of all, Paul was originally named Saul. God can change your name, but there's a significance to this. Like when uh, the Catholics have, uh, and some other religions as well, have a custom of changing people's names when they become a, a member of a religious order or something, signifying a new life and a new direction. That happened to Paul. So instead of being a continuous enemy of Christ, persecuting the early Christians, he became a friend of Jesus. He worked tirelessly for him. But God had to change him first. His name was changed. And our circumstances, they don't prevent God from fulfilling his plans. Uh, for example, uh, Paul was in Jerusalem. He ended up going toward Rome. Wasn't really what he wanted to do. But then he ended up, very strangely, giving encouragement to people from jail of all places. Instead of being discouraged and down and feeling like he was lost and was going nowhere, he accepted this as being part of God's plan and continued working for the Lord. And he actually ended up going in more places and doing more witnessing for the Lord because of the persecution he suffered. We need to also recognize God starts with who we are, not what we do. Notice the reference there in the scripture was to saints, not sinners. God take, recognizes where he wants us to be, and he can visualize that and wants us to move that way as if we're not sinners at all. We're saints walking with him toward the heavenly kingdom. And finally, the way of Jesus is the way of grace and peace. We need to join our life to Jesus. Uh, we shouldn't be walking the ways of violence and, and covetedness and trying to uh, get rich in the things of the world, but rather we should be looking for peace and grace. And may that be in, uh, happen in, in all levels of uh, this world, particularly in government. And if Ephesians is, is interesting in that in the 14 verses we find the phrase, in Christ used, in, in various ways. You're blessed in Christ, you're redeemed in Christ, you're forgiven of sins in Christ, you're chosen in Christ to be holy and blameless every spiritual blessing in Christ. You are included in Christ, made aware of the plans of God in Christ. And when we know we should follow them, shouldn't we? We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, been loved, and that's where the hope comes from, in Christ. If you, uh, look, these gentlemen here, these basketball players, you see they all have uniforms, they're all different. You know, when we come to live in Christ, we're going to look different on the outside. Just like if you change teams, which happens in many sports, when you join a new team, you put on a new uniform. The same thing happens to us in a spiritual sense when we get on Christ's team. We're going to put on a new uniform. We're going to live, look differently on the outside, and people may recognize it. We have this new identity when Christ lives in us because we're supernaturally joined to him. Move from death to life, from sinner to saint. And we can say, if Christ died, I died. He rose, I rose. If he wins, I win. If he can, I can. Not by yourself, of course, but through the spirit of God living in you. If he won't, I won't either. So, mm, Christ wouldn't do that. He wouldn't go in that place. Well, you don't either. If he would, I would. If he says, rise above it, rise above it. If he says, this is the way, you go walk in it. If he says, these are people want to serve and love, you go and serve and love these people. Says these are the ways I want to, to spend my resources, then I spend my resources in these ways. Ways that glorify God, consistent with his will, not the world's. So what happened to Paul? He had a rough life. He had to work hard. He went to jail a number of times. He was beaten and, uh, with rods and whips. He was stoned. He would frequently travel, which was extremely dangerous back then because there were robbers all over the place. Shipwrecked, not just once, but three times, and spent a whole day in the, out in the sea. He wasn't very popular. The Jews were chasing after him for becoming a Christian. Before that, the Christians hated him because he was persecuting them. And 
thereafter, he still had problems. Uh, he's, and many times he went without sleep, without food, water, but all the time he had a burden for God's people. He was trying to help them and guide them. He was the theologian of the church. But what did Paul say in, all, in response to this? If I must boast, I'll boast in, these, in the things which concern my weakness. God uses the weak, God, friends. Because if we are strong, we tend to think, well, it's my strength, my ability, which has enabled me to do this. Now, God wants to get the credit. He wants us to recognize our dependence upon him, as Paul addressed here. He said, "My further, my grace is sufficient for you. This is uh, God speaking to Paul. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Not our strength, our weakness. So uh, I will rather boast of my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, stresses. Why? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You need grace when you get in some of these bad situations in life. You crawl out of the gutter from the pit of sin. You've been in the ghetto of degradation. And you finally start moving to personal salvation. Maybe you come from a background of abuse. Uh, you've been victimized. You walk. Uh, you come into freedom. You're walking with Jesus. You might have left a, a life of crime as a victim or very frequently around here as perps. And you leave that behind you. You've, had a, you've been living a life in a bottle, getting high. You desert that. Or you survived uh, all sorts of bad physical things, injuries, pains, cancer, or a mental like depression or anorexia. Finally moving down into normalcy, you're blessed. That's grace. And when you leave behind a bad personality trait and you start to reflect the fruits of the Spirit, it's grace that allows you to do that. You escape from bad relationships, families with divorce, uh, they're d divided, the people are estranged from one another. They may be betrayed or feel that way. There's economic losses, business, money in businesses and homes. Uh, or maybe your life's just an autopilot. You're going along, you know, all's comfortable. You're not really having any particular direction why or where you're going. And then you recognize you need to point it to your life toward Jesus. Then you need grace, friends. So where are you? Are you walling misery because you've got down with these bad situations? Or you're walking with your friend Jesus, realizing that he's going to supply all the grace that you need, all you ever need, so that you can survive, so you'll be sustained, so you can turn around and come to him. Please do that, friends. Come to know your friend Jesus and accept the grace that he offers you. Give him thanks.